subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go. First of all, congratulations to those who have cleared the prelims examination. But you must remember that race is not finished yet and you have to maintain the momentum till the finish line. In this regard, we have two important announcements for you today. First of all, our main compass for Indian cultural heritage, modern, contemporary and world history is out on the eLearn platform. You can download it from there for free. The second announcement is concerning the General Studies Mains Test Series and Quality Improvement Program for Mains 2020. See, at this point in time, when you have cleared prelims and you are two months away from the mains examination, you have to revise all the themes for the coming mains exam. We have compiled the important themes for the coming mains exam subject-wise in the mains compass. And these are taken up in the Quality Improvement Program QIP classes. Apart from revision of important themes, you also have to do extensive answer writing practice because mains is all about answer writing practice. Mains is all about writing a good answer in 9 minutes. And you can get the feedback on your answers. You'll also get sample answers and personal mentorship from the teachers of ROS IS through the General Studies Mains Test Series and Quality Improvement Program. The feature of our mains test series and QIP classes are that there would be 100 hours of live answer writing and test discussions. There would be 10 thematic tests, there would be 12 full length GS tests and 2 full length essay tests. You will get the sample answers within word limit. This is a very important feature that will help you write proper answers in the final exam. You will get the detailed evaluation and feedback and personal mentorship. The course fee is as such rupees 30,000 but for those who have cleared the prelims and are our ex-students or DNS followers, they can avail the course for just rupees 5,500. The course will begin on October 27th. The link for registration has been given in the description section. So fill up the form and get mesmerized by Baswasa's class tomorrow. Buckle up, keep up the spirit. And let's make this means your best attempt. Now we shall take up the discussion on the Hindu Delhi edition dated 25th October 2020. We shall pick up important articles and discuss them from the perspective of civil service examination. The articles that we are going to take up for discussion has been tabulated in front of you. The time stamping for the same has been given in the description section. There is an article on page number 12 room temperature superconductivity possible but under severe pressure. See researchers from University of Rochester, researchers working at Intel and researchers at University of Nevada, they have created a material that is superconducting at 15 degrees Celsius. 15 degrees Celsius is the room temperature in many parts of Europe and US. The reason why this invention is very significant is so far superconductivity was understood to be possible at very low temperature as low as 0 Kelvin. So superconductivity at 15 degrees Celsius is huge. But there is a big BUT but although the barrier of reaching to very low temperature has been overcome because now it is possible at room temperature, the pressure applied has to be very high as high as 2.6 million atmosphere. The pressure that we are under due to the atmosphere is one atmosphere and 2.6 million atmosphere is very high. It is around 75% of the pressure which is exerted at the center of the earth. This effectively means that we are still years away from tasting superconductivity in our daily life. Basically we have moved from one problem to another. The problem of reaching to very low temperature to the problem of reaching at very high pressure. Because of the constraint of very high pressure, the immediate application will not be there. But that does not discount this invention. Reaching to great invention and discoveries are always incremental. Electricity, for example, which is one of the greatest invention of humankind, started with the humble experiments that J.J. Thomson carried out in 1899. Similarly, the fighter jets, the high-end military-grade aircrafts, they started with the work of Wright brothers 
which was not even appreciated at that point of time. The details of plate tectonics that we know today that was started by the work of Alfred Wigner in the form of continental drift theory and again that was not even appreciated but rather criticized at his time. So even though the invention does not find any immediate application but it needs to be appreciated just for the invention to have happened. For the civil service examination we need to know basics of superconductivity and that is what we are going to do now. See superconductors one that show superconductivity has two important properties and both of them are related to each other. Superconductors show zero resistance and they are diamagnetic, they show diamagnetism. Because of diamagnetism, there is possibility of zero resistance. See, I'll not get into the detail of superconductivity because that is very, very technical subject. In civil service examination, in science and tech portion, we mostly see application of technology and not the technicality of the technology. But still, I'll give you a very simplistic representation so that you understand this topic and you don't have to mug it up. See, you know that electricity is basically flow of electron. But for an electron to flow, it has to strive very hard because in the path, there are nucleus. Without application of electric field, the motion of electron is very random. To make the electron move in a particular direction, some electric field has to be applied because electric field exert force on electric charge. So when you apply a battery to a conductor, then that battery applies electric field. And in presence of that electric field, all the electrons move in one direction. But that motion is not very smooth because the path of electron is not free. The electrons will go in a straight line for a while, then it will collide with the nucleus. It has to change its direction, it will collide again, and then change the direction, it will collide again. And this is how it keeps on moving and finding its way through the wire. Because of these collisions, the energy of the electron is lost. And that comes out as heat energy. And that effectively provides resistance to the flow of electron. Now in a superconductor, as we have just seen, there is zero resistance. I'll give you a small feel as to why there is zero resistance at the state of superconductivity. As we have just understood, the resistance to the flow of electron comes because of collision. So at the state of zero resistance, there must not be any collision, which means that the electron must softly glide through the path without colliding with the nucleus. If that is possible, then only there will be zero resistance. And this is exactly what happens at the state of superconductivity. Electron flows in pairs, first of all, and these pair of electrons forms a kind of wave. And this wave sets in the space without having to collide with the nucleus. So the electrons keep flowing in pairs smoothly through the spaces without colliding with the nucleus and that gives zero resistance to the flow of electron. Now here comes the related concept of diamagnetism. Diamagnetism is the property of substance that repels the applied magnetic field. If you apply magnetic field to certain substance like ferromagnetic substance or paramagnetic substance, they will get attracted. So if you bring those substance in front of magnet, they will get attracted. Diamagnetic substance are those that will repel the applied magnetic field or they will repel the magnet. Why is it important here? See, if you have applied electric field within the matter, then those electric fields will force the electron to move in particular direction. Suppose there is an electron here, then this electron will be guided by electric field. So this electron will be forced to move in this direction and get collided by the nucleus. And whenever there will be collision, there will be resistance. So to avoid collision, there must not be any electric field within the conductor. Diamagnetic substances created field opposite to the applied field. So the field cancels out. So within the conductor, there is no field. There will be no collision only if there is no field. So zero resistance will come only if the substance is diamagnetic. That is why these two things will go together. The superconductor has to be diamagnetic and then only it can show zero resistance. But these two things does not come easy Either it will come at very low temperature or very high pressure. Now you can understand other things like superconductors will conduct electricity with no resistance, which means that they can carry very high current indefinitely without losing any energy. 
which effectively means that you can get electricity at your house without the need of any generator. It will come generally at very low temperature because the two electrons bind together at low temperature to form a wave as we are seeing here. This does not happen at high temperature ordinarily and that is why low temperature is required for binding of these electrons to form a wave and find their path through the space without colliding with the nucleus. And for that we require diamagnetism. Only diamagnetic substance can create magnetic field opposite to the applied magnetic field so that within the conductor there is no magnetic field. So that electrons are not forced to go in a particular direction. They can change their path as has been shown in this diagram. For that no electric field or magnetic field must be present within and for that substance has to be diamagnetic. Now there is a test of superconductivity. For example, this material of hydrogen sulfide that has been invented by these researchers to show superconductivity at very high pressure was also put to this test. The test is that if you apply sufficiently high magnetic field, then superconductivity will be lost. As we have discussed here, for superconductivity, there has to be no field within the conductor because the diamagnetic substance cancels the applied field but there will be limitation of cancellation. If you keep on increasing the strength of external field, then the internal field of the diamagnetic substance will not be able to match up with it. And if there is residual field, then superconductivity will be lost. So if you keep on increasing the external field to a very large value, at some point of time, superconductivity will be lost. So that act as a test of superconductivity. Scientists have been researching on superconductivity for more than a century. It was first discovered in 1911. And it was thought so far that superconductivity can be achieved at only very low temperature, zero Kelvin. With the discovery of achieving superconductivity at very high pressure, this traditional belief has been broken. So superconductivity can not only be achieved at very low temperature, but also at very high pressure. Superconductors have many advantages. For example, the power dissipation is not there. As we understand at the nuclear level, there is no collision. So there is no power dissipation. Because there is no resistance to the flow of electron, the devices working with superconductors can have very high operating speed and they can be extremely sensitive. We have applications of superconductivity, very important applications like MRI machines used in medicine. In MRI machine, there is a need of very high magnetic field. Very high magnetic field can come with very high current. And very high current is possible when resistance is very less. And superconductors offer no resistance. Very high current can flow through them. And that is tapped in MRI machines. Superconductivity has very important another application in magnetic levitation. Magnetic levitation, you understand, you must have seen in maglev train. In maglev trains, there is no contact between the rail and the wheel of the train. The wheel of the train is virtually floating above the rail. So there is no friction and the train can go at very high speed. The reason why it is possible, there is gravitational pull downward and there is repulsive force on these wheels by the rail. I have told you that diamagnetic material repel the external field. So this repulsive force upward can develop if the material is diamagnetic. But you understand that there will be a limitation of cancelling out the external field and doing repulsion. But in case of superconductor, this ability to repel the external force will be very high. So high that it can overcome the gravitational pulls of heavy material, the entire train. Although any diamagnetic material will oppose the external field, but it requires a superconductor to oppose a large external field and upheld the entire train in air. So this is the basic about superconductors that you need to know for the exam. There is an article on the science and tech page, evidence of dairy production in Indus Valley civilization. See 2020 has marked the 100 years of discovery of Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization. So for the coming mains examination, in this valley civilization is very important topic and that makes this article very pertinent for the coming mains. The most important finding of the study is that there was dairy product being processed in the Harappan civilization back in 2500 BCE. 
The earthen pots that were used in the civilization, they have been very helpful in making this finding. Because the dairy products which are in liquid phase, when they were kept in these earthen pots, the pores in these pots absorbed those dairy food material and kept them intact for this day to be found. The finding also has shed some light on the rural economy of the civilization. Because Harappan civilization largely is considered as urban civilization. We have detailed, elaborate information on the town planning, the bead industry, the external trade of the civilization, but we know very little about the parallel rural economy in this predominant urban civilization. This study has obliquely hinted that rural economy parallelly existed, and we'll see how. The study was conducted in Kotada Bhatli, which is a small archaeological site in the present day Gujarat. First of all, let's talk about how do we know that dairy processing was being carried out in Harappan civilization. As we have talked about, it is known from the archaeological evidence that pots, the earthen pots were used in the civilization. And these pots have pores. These pores absorb the liquid dairy product when they were stored in the pot. And the pot has preserved the molecules of these dairy products, the lipids, fats and proteins to the present day. And there's a simple technique of C16-C18 analysis that can be used to know the source of the lipid. See, fatty acids are simple carboxylic acids with long carbon chains. The number of carbon chain in the fatty acid, that depends on the source. C16 refers to 16 carbon in the chain. C18 refers to 18 carbon in the chain. Similarly, we have C13, C14, C15 and so hence and so forth. But the thing is that butter will have different ratio of C16 and C18. Cheese will have a different ratio. Other dairy products like curd will have different ratio. Milk will have different ratio. So analyzing the percentage of C16, C18 and other number of carbon chains, we can know what is the source of this fatty acid. And that's how we know that milk, curd and cheese, they were consumed in the Indus Valley civilization. But this is not carbon isotope analysis. This has been wrongly mentioned in the article as carbon isotope studies. Carbon isotope studies, which is C12 and C14, that gives the age of any material. That does not give the source of the lipid. So actually it is carbon number studies, whether the number of carbon in the fatty acid is 16 or 18 or any other number. The study also has proven beyond doubt that there was practice of animal husbandry. And this practice of animal husbandry has shed some light on the parallel rural economy in the predominant urban civilization. It has been shown in the study that animals were used in dairy production. The tooth enamel of fossils of cattle, water buffalo, goat, sheep, etc. They were studied. The tooth enamel tells a lot about what animal ate, how they lived. It is of huge value for paleontologists. Tooth enamel is highly mineralized part of our body. So the minerals which are found in the tooth enamel or in tooth, they tell us what the animal ate. And the study has shown that cows and water buffaloes were found to consume millets and sheep and goats were found to eat grass and leaves. And this practice even from today you would know that animals who are reared for meat production, they are given grass and leaves and animals which are reared for milk production, they are given the cereals. Further, the study also has shown that cattle and water buffaloes died at older age, suggesting that they were reared for milk production, while sheep and goat died at younger age, suggesting that they were reared for meat production. So this shows that proper animal husbandry was in practice. Additionally, the study has shown that large herd of animals were reared in various parts of the civilization. This suggests that milk were produced in surplus. This could have been used for exchange for other commodity from nearby settlements. And this could also have been used for industrial level dairy exploitation. But this large herd rearing could not have happened in the urban setup. So there must be a rural economy running in parallel to the urban economy. Although this is not very conclusive and the details we know not yet, but the study has shed some fresh light on the idea that rural economy must be existing in the predominant urban civilization.
There is a news article on page number 10. US allies welcome Israel Sudan deal, but Iran Palestine cry fall. In the Friday that has passed, Israel and Sudan has agreed to normalize relations between them. The agreement deal has been brokered by United States, making Sudan the third Arab country in the recent time to set aside hostilities with Iran and getting ready for a full diplomatic ties. The driver for this deal has come with the decision of Mr. Donald Trump to unlist Sudan from US list of state sponsors of terrorism. For a very long time, US has been keeping Sudan in its list of states sponsoring terrorism. Back in 1990s, the US embassies in Kenya and other African countries were attacked. US believed that Sudan has helped the attackers and the terrorists. Taking Sudan off the list of state sponsors of terrorism will also remove the sanctions imposed on Sudan that will make the international trade for Sudan easier. We have discussed in considerable detail in the DNS dated 15th of August 2020 why diplomatic relation between Arab countries and Israel ran into bad weathers. In 1967, the Arab League decided to not recognize Israel's sovereignty. This was followed by the Six Days War of 1967. We have also seen in that DNS as to what were the circumstances under which Egypt normalized its relationship with Israel in 1979 and then Jordan did the same in 1994. We also analyzed the changing geostrategic realities in the present time that led UAE to normalize its relationship with Israel in August 2020. And then pretty soon, Bahrain followed suit. And now like domino effect, Arab countries are normalizing their relationship with Israel. Sudan will now be the fifth Arab country to sign a peace treaty with Israel. But Sudan is in transition to democracy and it will take time for relationship to actually normalize. Now they have shown an intent to normalize. But UAE and Bahrain has gone a long way and they have went rush rush in normalizing the relationship. Flights have already resumed between these countries and business has started. In order to understand everything in perspective, you must revisit the 15th of August 2020 DNS. But what we take away from here, Sudan is the fifth Arab country. We will take some time to also talk about who are these Arab countries and what is Arab League. See, Arab countries are countries which are members of Arab League. There is no formal definition of Arab countries, but generally members of Arab League are taken to be Arab countries. There are 22 such countries as you can see on this map. The official language of these countries is Arabic. But it does not mean that all Arabic speaking nations are members of Arab world. For example, Malta, a small island nation in southern Europe, has an official language which is derived from Arabic, but it is not member of Arab League and as such is not considered part of Arab world. Similarly, Chad and Eritrea. They also have Arabic as official language, but they are not member of Arab League, so they are not considered as part of Arab world. Arab League or League of Arab States is a regional organization of African nations and Western Asian countries. It was formed in 1945. The purpose obviously was to draw closer relations between member states and coordinate and collaborate among them. Initially, it began with six members, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia and Syria. But presently, there are 22 nations. These nations are Yemen, Oman, UAE, Kuwait and Bahrain, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Syria. The membership of Syria is presently suspended. Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine. In this map, Palestine and Israel has not been shown properly because this map perhaps is presenting the viewpoint of the Arab League. Then we have Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania. And we also have Comoros Island. Altogether, there are 22 nations. But it is falling apart. Many nations have refused to participate in the meeting in the wake of UAE getting into Abraham Accord, the peace deal with Israel and then Bahrain following the suit. But what we have to know here, there are six countries with observer status and India is one of them. Apart from India, Eritrea, Brazil, Venezuela, Armenia and Chad are also there. But India is the only country without any significant Arabic speaking population 
with the observer status at Arab League. From the prelims examination perspective, you must know Berit declaration. This declaration is related to Arab League and was declared in 2019 as part of Arab Economic and Social Development Summit. It deals with two things. One is Arab free trade zone that they are trying to create and the other was regarding hosting Syrian refugees. Arab League called for support to nations who will be willing to host the Syrian refugees. It was a shift in the stand of countries like Saudi Arabia because previously they were not willing to support the cause of Syrian refugees. India have had very warm relation with Arab League. As we have talked about, India has the observer status in the league. The relation between India and Arab country is ancient, it is historic, it is cultural and it has huge economic significance in the present time. The total trade with Arab countries is about 180 billion US dollar. This region is home to 7 million Indians and it caters to 60% of our crude oil imports. Our trade with rest of the world passes through Swiss Canal, Red Sea, Gulf of Aden. Because of this close warm ties, India hosted the foreign members of 22 Arab League nations in January 2019. Some of the Arab countries are very very close. For example, Oman. India and Oman exchange ship visits on a regular basis. Oman has recently granted India berthing right of Indian naval ships. This is huge because China has naval bases in the region. The relation with Oman is so warm that some defense strategists suggest that there is a secret treaty between India and Oman that in case of war, one country will support the other. There is an article on page number 7, Kerala's move to bar CBI draws flak. You must have been reading about the Enforcement Directorate and Narcotics Control Bureau they have been investigating cases in Kerala and now, maybe sensing trouble, Kerala's government has decided to withdraw the general consent given by the states for CBI investigation. See, in this regard, you have to know that CBI draws its power to investigate from Delhi Special Police Establishment Act 1946. Through this legislation, CBI has been formed and CBI draws all its investigative power from this act. According to the provision of this legislation, CBI can take any case so moto in the Union territory of Delhi. However, in all other states, CBI needs the consent of the state to investigate any cases relating to the state or the cases which falls under the jurisdiction of the state. It's a simple question of federalism. India is a federal state. Although it is quasi-federal, but states have autonomy in their own rights. That is why Schedule 7 has divided various subjects for administrative purpose into three lists. State list, concurrent list and the union list. Law and order falls under the state list. So policing as such is the state subject. So center cannot intervene in the law and order matters of the state. And CBI, which is an investigative policing agency, can only investigate in the state with the consent of the state. This concept is called as the general consent in the matter of CBI investigation. But this does not mean that if states do not give consent to the state, CBI cannot investigate. If Supreme Court of India or any high court orders the CBI to take up the case, then general consent is not required in that case. Also in the Union Territory of Delhi, which has a state legislature and a chief minister, consent is not required because, in, because here CBI can take the cases so moto. And on case by case basis, if a state government requests for CBI investigation and union government agrees to it, then also CBI can take up the case. There is an article on page number 9 regarding Himalayan brown bears. We will see certain points from prelims perspective that we need to know for Himalayan brown bears. First of all, as the name suggests and as you can see in this picture, the brown bear has brown coat and that's how it has got the name. It is one of the largest carnivorous species in the highlands of Himalayas. The IUCN status, very very important, is least concern. Himalayan brown bear as such is found throughout the western Himalayan states. It can be found in Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. It is sighted at higher elevation between 3,000 to 5,000 meter. They also have been observed in the western Ladakh. 
in the upper Suru and Zaskar valleys. But the best place to find Himalayan brown bears is the Greater Himalayan National Park in Himachal Pradesh. This regional specificity of species is very important. UPSC keeps asking this. For example, UPSC has asked about specific habitat of certain species like Shanghai, like Gharial. So if there is regional specificity of some species, you have to take note of that. And the specificity of Himalayan brown bears is Great Himalayan National Park in Himachal Pradesh. These bears are one of the least arboreal bear species. Arboreal species are those who spend most of the time on trees like panda. As we have seen here, the habitat of Himalayan brown bear lies at higher elevation. And the places at higher elevation is most vulnerable to global warming. And that is the biggest threat to the survival of Himalayan brown bears. This article from page number 9 is on close quarter carbines that India was about to procure from UE government. Defence Acquisition Council cleared its procurement, but then recently the Defence Ministry has cancelled the procurement plan. Close quarter carbines are carbines basically. It's a kind of assault rifle as you can see. But it is a smaller in size, lighter in weight, and its barrel is also shorter. It can be handled easily, it can be maneuvered easily, but it is short range, as you can see from the name close quarter. Basically, it is used for indoor purpose. When the terrorists are close by, maybe some operation in a building, in that cases, in that cases, these kind of assault rifles are used. These are lighter form of assault rifles, basically. Here you have to know just two things. Close quarter carbines that India was about to buy was from which country? That was UAE. But since the deal has been cancelled out, the significance of this is less. Secondly, you have to know about Defence Acquisition Council and I hope you know who heads the council and who are the members of the council. Now let's do question for the day. Last DNS question was this. Consider the following statements with regard to Joint Parliamentary Committee. Speaker must give his or her approval for its constitution. It's an incorrect statement because JPC can be constituted even by the resolution of the House. The second statement was, it has 22 members, 15 from Lok Sabha and 7 from Rat Sabha. Actually, the number could be anything. But always and always, the number of members from Lok Sabha will be double that from Rat Sabha. It could be 15, it could be 18, it could be 21, 24, 30, any number. So the answer would be option D, none of the above. Today's question is this, consider the following statements regarding Indus Valley civilization. Statement 1, dairy processing was done. Statement 2, animal husbandry was practiced. Statement 3, we have definite proof of existence of large parallel rural economy. Your options are 1 only, 1 and 2 only, 2 only, all of the above. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. Thank you very much and do not forget to attempt the DNS quiz on our eLearn platform.